we'll get started. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, this is the panel on the Equality Machine by Professor Orly Lobel. I am Susie Babka. I am a professor in the Theology and Religious Studies Department here at USD. I'm also the Technology and Humanities Element Chair of the Humanities Center here on campus. And so we have all sorts of uh, talks and things going on at the Humanities Center that are open to the public and obviously our campus and keeping these sorts of conversations going is really important to us at the Humanities Center. And so I'd also like to thank Dr. Brian Clack, who directs the Humanities Center for his association with um, the Festival of Books and for um, putting these panels together. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Orly Lobel, the author of The Equality Machine. She is an award-winning author of several books. She's the Warren Distinguished Professor of Law here at the University of San Diego. She is the director of the Program of Employment and Labor Law, as well as the founding faculty of the Center for Intellectual Property and Markets here at USD. She's the author of two previous books, You Don't Own Me, which is also for sale and can be signed out there. How Mattel versus MGA Entertainment Exposed Barbie's Dark Side, and Talent Wants to Be Free, Why We Should Learn to Love Leaks, Raids, and Free Writing. Um, her books and work have been written about in The Economist. The Economist named The Equality Machine as one of its best books for 2022. Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, Financial Times, Globe and Mail, NPR's Marketplace, CNBC, and CNN Funny. And she just told me that um, she'll be at Stanford. Stanford Medical School is making the equality machine required reading of all of its med students, which is really good news considering that the AI revolution is going to mean so much in the healthcare and, and care fields in general. So just as someone who studied philosophy, religion, and the arts, and not computers and technology, I sort of leave that for my husband, the engineer, I appreciate that this book, The Equality Machine, is written in such an engaging and conversational style and found it a really fun read, um, as well as informative. Obviously, there is so much in here that, um, that we have to learn from. Some of my favorite chapters in the book are on things that make us human. One of the reasons why I got involved in technology and the humanities is that I think that given what AI is revolutionizing out there and, and, and the developments are so fast and coming that it's hard to keep up, that it, it, it holds a mirror up to our society in terms of what we value about being human. And I think that um, Professor Lobel has given us so much of that in this book. Our embodied experience, sexuality, gender, family life. I was also particularly fascinated um, as the book touches on your research on dolls and what they do to inspire care, alleviate loneliness and teach empathy and what this can mean for uh, care robots as well as sex robots. Of course, that with the phenomenon that is the Barbie movie, which I haven't seen, but it's a, it's a cultural uh, phenomenon. Um, I have to ask you about uh, your book, You Don't Own Me, and your impressions about popular culture's fascination with Barbie. Yeah, well, thank you for that wonderful uh, start and introduction. And Dr. Babka is such a leader in, uh, here on campus thinking about developments in technology and thinking exactly like you say about our ongoing commitments to our values, our normative ways of life, um, our shared collective, uh, shared mission, and um, really kind of making the world brighter. And um, I saw the both books as really thinking about, you know, what do we value and how um, is our uh, market, our societies, uh, how are they structured to support that or hinder that? Um, and it is a weird moment for me where this is the summer of Barbie and it's the summer of AI and chat GPT and generative AI. And so I have my two recent books kind of uh, in the news and also in some kind of interplay between them because uh, as you say, it's like 
robots and dolls, they, they have a connection of how do we think about our inanimate objects? How do we think about the culture, the things that we design? How do they shape our perceptions, our preferences, our interactions amongst ourselves? And that was kind of what I wanted to, to research. Um, about the Barbie book, I'll, I'll say that um, I tell this story uh, in the book that I was a, a very early critic of the doll industry, the toy industry more generally. Uh, when I was maybe six years old, my mother, who's a psychology professor, put me in these videos, uh, research videos, not like YouTube, Instagram videos like today. Um, but she, she had me play with what we call the um, pink shelf, the dolls and tiaras and makeups and you know kind of plastic pink in one set of videos and then in another one with the boy toy shelf, the, the blue shelf where I was playing with trucks and with like swords and, and soccer um, balls. And she ran these studies all over the world. So from the United States, uh, she, she ran them in Israel and Europe and in um, Japan and Korea. And she had participants watching this little girl, me, um, kind of assess what, is, what are, are my capabilities, what is the likelihood of me being a leader, succeeding later in life. I was very consistent across all these cultures that when I was playing with the uh, boy toys, the more masculine toys, people thought I was smarter, more likely to be a leader, um, more um, like uh, just a stronger character and et cetera. And the reverse was she ran it with boys and it was like, um, it still held true that like boys that were playing with girl toys were assessed as kind of lower in all kinds of personality stuff. So. For me, you know, it's when I started researching uh, the doll industry, the toy industry, as an example of how we need to think seriously of what does competition look like, what do, does it look like to have um, corporate ethics. It, it, like, I actually wasn't realizing that it was bringing me back to being a very early critic and kind of. Uh, understanding that we create meaning through the products that we consume, through the um, images that become so iconic around the world. And I wanted to show, really the book, You Don't Own Me, is, is really showing that we are very aware that we have these cultural wars and corporate kind of dog, -eat -dog worlds. Um, when we talk about Wall Street, um, and like the financial industry. We understand that it happens in the tech industry and Silicon Valley, but we're here in Southern California. We, we live here and we work here and we research here and we play here. And I wanted to show that exactly the same dynamics of what eventually we have that shapes our imagination, limits or, or expands our vision of what we can be. Um, is very much constructed by who controls the toy and entertainment and content industries of Southern California, you know, like Hollywood and beyond. And, and it was very, it's a, it was a great experience to like, this is the summer of Barbie right now, but like I actually have some critique of the, I did see the movie. Uh, I went dressed up as Barbie with my girlfriends um, and my daughter saw the movie. And it's not like it's it's a good movie for what it is, but it it's just shows you a real sliver of what is actually going on behind the scenes, which is the story that I tell. Um, actually, I don't know if I told you this, Susie, but um, CBS is now developing "You Don't Own Me" into a mini series. Oh, wow! Um, and but it's really about the behind the like the story of how she was invented, Barbie the doll, and then how Bratz was invented, and how we have this roller coaster. Um, 10 year um, legal battle, but also market battle of like, do we have other options? And and really what we see in the movie is just kind of, you kind of, if you know the behind the scenes, you understand that the movie was only um, like able to be, to be had, to be developed now because we had this shaking up of the industry and we had a change in the leadership at Mattel because, because of all the kind of 
dirt that was exposed <laughs> from from this uh, story that I felt. Oh, that's that's really fascinating. I'm <laughs> so excited that that's going to be made into a series. Um, so in the book, um, Professor Lavelle passionately argues that equality is today's foremost moral imperative and that we must understand technology as a public good. And to me, that's very compelling, thinking of technology as a public good and what that might mean, um, something that we should all have access to. For example, um, equality, though, is an aspirational goal in our democracy. It hasn't really materialized yet um, because we don't see equality between the sexes, between the genders, between sexual orientations, ethnicities, races, economic classes. And so um, the key that I think that we're after is how do we envision what equality means for how it will help us um, have a value to guide, to help us with technology, but also um, as a tool that values diversity and empathy um, in areas of, of culture and society that have historically been plagued by bias and inequity. So if you have some things to say about what that means in terms of the title. Yeah, the equality machine. So the title is a contrarian title. It, the, the equality machine um, was motivated by what I saw and I still see as distorted conversations that we're having about technology and especially now artificial intelligence and how it will affect our society. So I'm sure so many of you, all of you, are, are seeing kind of the very alarmist um, story of we have technology that is going to, the, the kind of the biggest alarmist part is what I call the Terminator fallacy, where like it's going to kill us all, right? That's like down the road, we have to be, you know, aware that that's a possibility. And, you know, there's no denying that we need to, um, understand you know what are the risks and we need to talk about them but there's also that's you know that's very much down the road to something that is not in existence um, what we call artificial general um, intelligence nobody is claiming that you know we're we're anywhere near there right now um, what the other kind of part of alarmist um, story or or the kind of focus the tunnel vision focus on the problems and the risks that we see in our conversations about technology is that it's exacerbating inequality, um, that uh, we're automating bias, which is the title of like one bestseller, or that we're creating weapons of math destruction where um, suddenly, you know, like the, all the, the gaps are amplified, the biases are amplified. And I set out to um, tell different stories to tell, uh, to have a different narrative in the equality machine where we're all having a more informed conversation, a more um, constructive conversation because, you know, the train has left the station. You know, a lot of the kind of uh, suggestions that you see in kind of the, the alarmist uh, camp is, okay, yeah, let's, let's just not research and, and not deploy the, you know, the, the technology that's being developed. Let's do a moratorium for six months. Let's think about it. Like, um, don't automate. There's all these, also on our, on our policy sides, uh, both um, here in California and the federal government and, and in, the, in Europe, you have these like, just keep the humans uh, in the loop and don't let, you know, don't automate it processes. And what I wanted to do with the equality machine is say, look, it's not never to deny that there are fails, that there can be um, inequities that are baked into our technologies, but um, there is huge potential. And as you say, you know, we have so much inequity that exists right now. We have such wicked problems around the world and here in the United States of um, racial inequality, um, uh, you know, gender uh, biases, um, inequities, class inequities. We have poverty. We have um, you know challenges of of climate and uh, hunger and, and and health challenges. We you know we had a global pandemic. We need to be with skin in the game to imagine how technology can help us um, tackle those challenge those, those real problems 
And I find these hugely inspirational stories, which I, you know, I, I really wanted to, to tell in the book of people who are actually doing that constructive work and using algorithms to de-bias our, our human you know, fallibility to, to create um, processes that are more consistent with our values of not, you know, not caring about somebody's ethnicity when you're um, applying for a loan or um, you know, a, a job or when um, we're thinking about like schooling and, and, and using technology not only um, in kind of sorting and, 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 and uh, making better decisions, but also helping us understand the root causes of our inequities. So, I mean, you asked a, a really profound question of like, how do we define equality? That's, it's, that's like, a, you know, all the way down, very hard question. Um, and there's going to be different answers, answers uh, by different communities, different democracies, um, different contexts will require a, a specific analysis. But there are a lot of things that we can agree about. Um, we can, for example, I have a, a chapter um, on health where I show that the history of humankind has been um, to like have a, a very prototypical kind of human body. Um, uh, so much of our research, our clinical trials, things that have been approved by the FDA have been done on um, the, the white male yeah. um, you know, uh, physical, you know, uh, testing. And we right now are at the cusp of having um, the abilities to expand dramatically the information, the data, the analysis that we can make and can do on what is needed to, to have personalized medicine, to have more tailored mm -hmm. treatment and care um, and, and scale that, scale, scale the, the abilities, the capabilities that are, we're building um, not only to different like um, identity groups, but also around the world. You know, there's uh, I talk about the hubris of saying, "Oh, we're not going to automate because like if we have these two most expert radiologists that are looking at a mammogram, um, maybe they're slightly outperforming uh, the the automated system that was just invented." And I say. But most people around the world, if you think about the developing world, uh, you know, people in, in countries and, and communities where they can't afford the animal mammogram, um, it's that's not the right question to ask. If you know the, the the automated system is exactly the same and its accuracy as as two you know the two best doctors that we have in the world, we have huge shortages in that kind of expertise and huge economic barriers for everybody having that access to, to care. And I can tell that same, and I do tell the same story about education and um, access to justice and, and um, equality within the home and an intimate relation. So, um, you know, telling those stories, I think is very empowering for all of us to have, you know, it's, it's opening up conversation to have more and more of those visions. Right, right. And I think that's a great segue to um, how you frame the book as uh, as a mom myself. I, I really appreciated that you framed the book with the story of your daughter, Eleanor, the, her bionic, she uh, calls her her bionic daughter. And those of us who grew up with the bionic man series, the bionic woman series. And I think that maybe, you know, some of the things that you're talking about are so hopeful in terms of really, you know, that was kind of a crazy show from the 70s and 80s, but you're talking about some things that have really helped her life. Yeah, yeah, it's here. I mean, we are, in some ways, we're all becoming bionic. And, and with Eleanor, I, I, it's, it's actually the first sentence in the equality machine. Um, I have three daughters, the middle one is bionic. And I tell the story about how um, my middle daughter has type one diabetes. And um, for the first time ever, um, a year ago, the federal, um, the, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, approved a closed loop insulin pump and continuous glucose monitor that make autonomous decisions. So kind of taking the human out of the loop 
um, and it's life-saving. It's this is diabetes, um, like other um, you know other conditions, uh, is like a 24-hour, 24/7 uh, um, challenge that requires so much attention. And and as humans, we're you know we have limited cognitive capacities. We get depleted. Uh, we we are um, not accurate always in our calculations of how much to pump, you know, insulin, how, how to uh, calculate the boluses and all that. And it's just, it's, it's been life changing to millions and millions of children and, and adults around the world to have this technology. Um, but it's just an example. There's like, I, you know, I see um, Dr. Bakta is wearing her um, Apple watch you know, I, I talk about um, researchers who have themselves like shifted into um, trying to think about positive uses of technology because they saw what effect it had on their lives, on their um, health management, on adherence to care, on um, their being present. So there's, I, I, what, what I set out also to do in the equality machine is to disabuse us of a lot of um, kind of conventional wisdoms. Like my hope is that everybody that reads the book challenge, like questions their own assumptions. Um, so there's this assumption that technology is making us less connected, right, with each other. That that if you introduce technology, you're like going to be just uh, you know like playing the video game. That's kind of the paradigmatic image, and and not interacting with your peers, with your friends, with your family. That's, you know, just one path, but we can build these other paths and we are, you know, we do have potential. So I just came back, um, I was telling Susie, I, I uh, spent the summer in, um, in Europe and in Israel and I, I uh, was um, keynoting the United Nations AI for Good Summit um, this July in, in Geneva. And it was an amazing experience, mind-blowing experience for me because it was the largest conference ever to have, um, or the largest uh, number of humanoid robots under one roof. And a lot of the robots that I talk about in the book that I kind of, I, uh, a lot of it I, I researched during COVID so when I was writing about like Japanese robots and I had planned to, to travel to Japan, I couldn't travel and I was researching them. And then actually in April, I did get to go to Japan and became like a G7 representative to the Japanese uh, government on, because they have been like thinking about AI for good, but they're really leaders in embodied robots. But at this conference, I met, for example, Paro, the, um, baby seal yeah. robot um, that has AI, has facial recognition, emotional recognition built in. Um, and and his creator, or its creator, or her creator, you know, their creator, um, at, who, this is a, a Japanese um, computer scientist, and uh, he was there. And I got to meet the original Paro, but, but what was, what is striking, and I describe this in, in the book, is that the research, so so people have these like knee-jerk reactions of like what technology means. Um, if, if you put like a robot in a room, then again, like there's an assumption that you won't be interacting with uh, our, you know, with humans and, and losing our humanity. And the, it's, it's a little known fact that the FDA has actually a <coughs> power for treating people with dementia, with Alzheimer's, and, and beyond that, um, Paro is actually purchased by the New York City um, Department, like Department of uh, Elderly Care um, during the pandemic and, and distributed to many people that were living in isolation. Because for all of us, having kind of a pet that helps us uh, you know, alleviate our loneliness is, is, is proven, clinically proven to be um, you know, effective, but but more than that, the research shows that when you introduce that kind of pet robot, it's it in fact increases in um, elderly homes, also in schools. I describe you know a chapter about education and cute robots that are introduced to be kind of like the tutor assistant of teachers. 
Um, it actually makes uh, the kid, all of us more interactive with one another, with our caretakers, with our teachers, people just um, become more open, more um, connected, uh, more um, alert. So, so there are ways to design technology that do exactly the opposite from, you know, kind of that party line of, oh, we will all just be in our little <laughs> zone of, of video games. Right, right. And so um, I, th th this is something that I really appreciate about the book is that you want us to get beyond that binary of good versus bad technology. But the problem is that when we get beyond the binary, then we're in a really fluid, ambiguous place. And that makes a lot of people nervous. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you were you're talking about education. This is what I'm seeing is that education helps create more ways to introduce comfort with nuance and complexity. And so we don't have to fear something that is, um, as, as, as you said, has been painted in such a bad way. So I appreciate that in terms of getting beyond that binary of this is bad, this is good. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that moment that we're in right now of thinking about the complexity of all of these things that go into it. Yeah, I think it's always hard to, to be in some uncertainty and complexity. That's like just our human nature. We want to, like it's easier to, to be just a critic or, um, yeah. I, I, you know what, when I get calls about the book from journalists, I, I tell them, you know, you're part of the story. You're just telling the bad, the fails. Um, why aren't you telling more of that complex story and more of the rich story and more of the vision of like all these great things that are actually underway? How it's, uh, you know, technology is really creating more, as I said, access and accuracy and consistency and inclusion. And some reporters are, are really kind of frank with me. They're like, my editor says, well, if it bleeds, it reads. Yeah. <laughs> we have to like, we just have to tell that flat story. So I think, it, I, I love how you said it, but you know, part of, we think, and, and I think you're leading a lot of this thinking in, in the university, at the university where like, what do we do with generative AI and chat GPT? And like, how do we think about the education of our students now that we have these newfound um, capabilities and some some things we won't have to do or, or if they're supporting what we do so what are the next steps so again I think about it as an opportunity like yeah if we can um, take away some of the more mundane tasks of doing all kinds of things like proofreading um, like creating the blue book or like the footnotes of something and and we have a technology that does it we can actually focus more on the core, you know, questions that are motivating us, our, our core humanity, and 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 teach all of us, teach our students, but also you know, create kind of um, more space within us to be more comfortable with the richness mm -hmm. of human creativity. Right, right. Um, and so, uh, I, I'm going to ask the regulation question because this is. Part of the, the reason why people, I think, are afraid of some of this technology is because they feel like it's going to get out of control. And obviously, who's making the decisions is always a problem. But tech companies, um, Google, Apple, you know, uh, Meta, are sort of notoriously antagonistic to <laughs> regulation. And so I was wondering if you had a few things to say about what it means for us as consumers, as citizens, that you know, how do we spread out that that power, that decision making ability beyond just the corporations that want to make money? Yeah, yeah. Th I mean, those are uh, complex questions, and I. Um, it's interesting. Like all three of the books that you mentioned, definitely in the background, the big elephant is wanting to have competitive markets and consumer choice, and not just like single card like monopolies that are determining the path and again part of the equality machine was like if we're all with skin in the game in this conversation that will be it will be harder for like one corporation like open ai to determine everything because people will be more informed in what they demand consumers will be more sophisticated and not just kind of um 
accepting uh, you know a, a single story. There is a rule. Uh, there is definitely a room for regulation. I um, talk a lot though about like what I don't want as like what I think is bad regulation of just kind of banning technologies right, right. of being. Um, I, I talk in some in some parts about how I think that we have been privileging privacy over some other um, goals that we have. So again, I love privacy. <laughs> I have to always say this, um, so I'm not misunderstood. Um, on the board of uh, the National uh, Future of Privacy Forum, and and I, um, you know, I, I I want to have pr privacy policy that's strong, but I also think that we have to recognize the costs. Where if we're not collecting data, like I mentioned with the health um, aspect, we have missing data sets. So there's a room for regulation that will also. Um, be more proactive of completing, like collecting more public information, having public options, open source, um, uh, like software or like um, applications of the the technologies that are being developed by just a handful of corporations. Um, there's there's a lot to be done, but it has to be the right kind of policies. Hey, um, so I think maybe what we should do is open it up for questions. Does anyone want to ask Professor Lobella a question? Yes. I am very excited to read your book, and it ties into my question. So about 10, 12, about 15 years ago, I was computer science faculty. I've since moved on to do something else. And at the time, I published a computer science textbook with this exact same theme, the idea that we were talking too much about the negative and we should be talking about the positive, and it was case studies and positive things were being done. And the reaction that I got at the time from the computer science educator and community was one of two things. This is not our realm. This should be talked by people in the social sciences, not us. Or, yes, it's really the negative things if we're going to bring up social issues at all because then we can, you know, talk about the things that have gone wrong. And I am curious if you've had any interaction now, I mean, this is 15 years later, with people in the computer science faculty community specifically and how they're reacting to this now? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think that the my sense is that the computer science community, the pendulum maybe has um, moved in, in the direction of seeing so much of the negative and the alarmist um, at this point that they do want more kind of uh, the voice of reason and um, showcasing their their research that is positive. So in the book, I, I interview leading scientists, computer scientists from MIT, from Carnegie Mellon, from you know uh, really uh, great institutions that are developing um, algorithms that are much more the gold standard of how do we make sure that they're not um, baking in past biases and that they're like um, using um, two algorithms that one is like sorting and one is uh, auditing. Um, and what I try to do, because I'm not a computer scientist, is tell their stories in ways that are really accessible to all of us and then bring in the conversation. I, I love how you said that, that it's like there is that disconnect that the computer scientists, they, they feel like they're not ethicists, they're not social scientists. so. They need the, the collaboration. Um, I think it's also to Susie's question about like policy. I think you know there's a role for policy to bring you know different communities and different expertise to bear on these questions together. And so I think it is a moment where there is a thirst for. I mean, I would love to hear more of your voice in that uh, as well. And but but exactly like you say, like showcasing the positive case studies is, is really what opens our imagination up and, and um, builds a path to a brighter future. Another question? Yes. You spoke quite a bit about having, about individuals having skin in the game. I guess I'm not really understanding what you mean by that. And admittedly, I haven't read your book. Um, you know, it seemed like these, these AI uh, tools are built 
on the backs of data from every individual. So what what kind of skin in the game are you referring to? Yeah. Well, so I don't think there's like one answer on what skin in the game is because um, the way that you you just framed it is like how do we consumers um, like become more proactive on the data that we're already seeing and and I agree that like solutions of just like opting out or like mandatory disclosures about the, by the corporations that are just like click wrap are not really creating our autonomy. I actually mean um, or for the most part in, in, in kind of the call to action, I mean um, being more informed, um, not just um, allowing the kind of irrational and, and skewed conversations to just kind of be uh, something that we accept, but, but being um, part of the a more um, substantive and accurate conversation. But more than that, what I um, have found and, and what I argue in the book is that when we hear only the negative, the next generation, so if you look at even like our students, when they think about whether they want to go into STEM, whether they want to go to uh, work for big tech, um, when they're told all the time the story of just the bad that that like uh, Google and Facebook and uh, you know Tesla, they're just kind of just and Twitter, they're they're just amplifying negative stuff and not and not telling the story of how they um, are contributing and can be contributing to a lot of access um, and and um, closing of gaps, uh, creating digital literacy, um, creating um, more equities around the world, they, they opt out of, the, of STEM in general. So, so you get this vicious cycle where if we're told that Silicon Valley is a bro culture and it just like caters to a very particular part of our like communities and demographics, you'll see like less women going into STEM. And, and so, so I, I keep calling for you know us to to understand that skin in the game is also working for companies that can be um, you know that they're there like I, I use this term I think before like this, the train of this has left the station we you know we do have these corporations that are shaping a lot of our like the worlds around us so we actually want to um, not just be like a critic from the outside, but actually being proactive, whatever work you choose, and and not, I I I, I tell a lot of these stories of um, people that I really respect, but that have kind of been saying, don't work for any like Silicon Valley tech company because it's all evil, and that's you know that's exactly the opposite of skin the game. Like, just don't be there. Just like just you know, write op-eds about how bad they are. That's not enough. So so if you want to change the world for the better, then design the robots, like uh, Susie alluded to the fact that I even talk about like our sexuality and I have a chapter about sex tech and sex robots. And, and I, I'm very critical of like the ways that sex robots are being designed today. It's like really catering to all our stereotypes. Actually, similar to what I described in You Don't Own Me with like Barbie being, you know, having been for years, just, you know, vanilla blonde, uh, you know, impossible image of a woman and very stereotypical. And if you want skin in the game, if you want change, then don't just be a critic, but design something, build something that you want to see out there in the world. Yes. I was going to ask, I know Europe is doing away with the tick. TikTok, is that correct? And so, you know, you have three daughters, and some of the stuff that they're watching on the phone and everything, what is your opinion of how algorithms could help make them better people instead of, oh, I wish I looked like her or whatever? Yeah. No, great question. And and it's not just TikTok, of course. Like, Instagram was, you know, part of the congressional hearings of, like, how it contributes, may contribute to um, especially girls like body image, anorexia. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important is, again, to think about this in a more nuanced way and to think about it as 
um, like teaching kids digital literacy in a more meaningful way. So not just like telling them, this is all bad, don't be on social media, because that's just not feasible yeah. for, like there's a lot of benefits that come from being online and being um, feeling empowered and feeling comfortable and doing like searches and using chat GPT and other, <laughs> But explaining to them, so so there's, I think there's a parenting role. There is also a, a regulatory role, a policy role where we need to have more transparency of how algorithms are recommending things and to have options there. And there are like now options that like settings where you actually see in your feed, not, you know, the, the things that are going to keep you more on time, like more time on the app versus just you can you can be proactive and saying like, I, I want to see just my friends or, so I think we need, like there's design solutions, there's policy solutions, and there's also um, really kind of getting the kids more educated about what they can do and what they want to do. Yes. Um, thank you for showing, for doing this research on, um, you know, it's very easy to take these words out and really demonize them. Um, I think something that I do see as kind of black and white, though, is where we're extracting, you know, we're so wasteful, where we're extracting the materials for the hardware and where we're dumping it. Yeah. So it's not in our backyard, at least not in, you know, not in America. So have you seen in your conferences or in the industry people care about that? Talk, you know, real um, energy and resources put into that problem? Yeah, no, it's a great uh, question and, and aspect of like the environmental consequences of our technologies. Um, there, um, there's a book that's called The Atlas of AI that has um, really good uh, Kate Crawford um, mm -hmm. that that really kind of focuses on that uh, environmental aspect. I do, I I do say in the book, and I do um, want to emphasize that we can, we are also, and we should be. Um, using AI to tackle a lot of the environmental issues that um, have pervaded, you know, that, that are really like such an acute um, problem right now globally. So um, I, I talk about like um, automating um, ocean cleaning and um, I, I talk about drones that can um, do a far better work uh, far, far better job in um, endangered species um, protection. So in Africa, there these are new technologies that are being developed where like there's predictions of where poaching of um, endangered or um, safari animals uh, will go. And, and it's just really kind of elevating our ability to protect our environment um, in various ways. There's lots of, it's like a whole, I mean, in, in general, um, all the breakthroughs, I would venture to say, that are like major breakthroughs in, in so many different um, areas of our world, in health, in environmental um, uh, responsibility, sustainability, um, and, and in uh, other areas, are happening through machine learning, large language modeling. So, so there's lots of potential. But you're absolutely right that the hardware um, we need much, much better solutions, and we need to understand that there's, you use that term, uh, not in my backyard, there's like a NIMBY effect that's happening, um, and so it, it has to be a collective action solution. It has to be more than just an American, you know, or like a national solution. There, there's, there's really a role for international um, action. When I was in school, I remember one of the professors reminded us that do not believe everything you read. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, the AI produced and can promote all this wonderful information. I think it's also very important to promote the ability to have critical thinking, because not all the AI produced information is the truth, 100%. So when you're responding to the other ladies, we comment about TikTok. I thought that's what it's all about. 
that we have to maintain the ability to have critical thinking. So not everything spew out from the AI is 100% right, correct. I just want to say that. Yeah, no, that's a, a great way to put it. Um, so specifically with AI, with generative AI and with ChatGPT, it's, it's actually a real like puzzle that's being tackled. Um, um, what makes um, ChatGPT hallucinate yeah. or create um, this false information? Um, so there is kind of that technical puzzle that the computer scientists are grappling with, and, and it is a frontier there. Um, but much broader than that, what you are saying is that, and, and this is part of what I refer to as digital literacy, that um, instead of just telling kids that like there's this really powerful over, you know, like omnipotent thing that's like algorithms and um, social media and kind of just warning them, like stay off it, um, you know, don't um, imitate, like all these things, being much more, um, I think, yeah, much more um, kind of deep on how do, how do we assess something, how do we create critical thinking, how do we report, how do we design things better, why are we upset about something, um, you know, how do we find the, the communities, the online communities that we can, <coughs> which is so important. Again, like, if you think about recent movements, and I, I talk about this, um, of like, um, the women's movement, uh, uh, Me Too, I see you're, you're uh, you have the Black Lives Matter, like, you know, so much of our social change has been um, recently enabled by our uh, interconnectivity or our connection um, digitally. Right. Um, these are movements that would not have been, like, uh, spurred in that way if we didn't have that ability. So. Being critical in like what we seek and what we want out of the technology and what's possible is, I think, exactly what you said. And that's a great point to end on because um, one of the things USD wants to do is provide AI literacy and that and 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 make that with the critical thinking that's led by the humanities led by the liberal arts. And Professor Lovell certainly talks about the importance of all the liberal arts in terms of fostering that, cultivating that critical thinking that we're going to need to shape that vision of what we want out of all of this te technological revolution that we're in the middle of. Thank you so very much uh, to um, Professor Lovell for her wonderful book. It's really terrific and, or well, books, I should say, and for all of you coming today. So thank you all. Oh, and she'll be out there to sign her books and um, and, and chit chat with anyone who wanted uh, to discuss further.